Uh, Liam, could you tell us a bit about uh, your background and how when you first got involved in the Republican movement and what the movement was doing at that time? Well, if I got in, I got involved in the movement in 1954, just after the Armagh raid, which occurred on the 17th of June 1954. And not realising that in, in six months' time I'd be marching around the same barracks as an IRA agent at the time in, in Gaffa Barracks. But that's when I first, uh, okay. um, first got involved. Um, there's, uh, I'd have to tell you this because you can cut it out if you want to, you know. But I, I remember I was attached to recruits, mostly recruits, and uh, I'd go around on a bicycle uh, organised recruit for meetings and getting them organised to become members of the Republican movement or the IRA at that time. And uh, some of it was very funny in a way when you think back on it now because uh, the recruiting officer, we had George Starr from, I think he lived in Batty Farmers. We had uh, Eamon McAmoss and a uh, nephew of Sean Russell, which was Bob Russell. And uh, I worked after the recruit, she'd done a three month uh, recruit course all over the places in Dublin. And then you were brought then into the ranks of the IRA and you had to be sworn in. And uh, the Adjutant General at the time was Charlie Morphy and Charlie insisted that I, I, after the three months it had to be um, brought in and sworn in into the Irish Republican Army. So uh, that happened to myself and Tomás McGillan because the two of us were to go and get sworn in. Now in the ranks of the, the, those recruit classes were Lee Munch. Because I, I recruited him in uh, Crumlin in uh, the 50s, in 54. And uh, I remember him the, the day well. Uh, it was on a Saturday afternoon and he was up having a shower and he came down and I told him all about the IRA and well, uh, where to go and that's Liam was brought here. Allow much a lot more. After the Armour Raid, the Armour Raid didn't bring in all that many recruits in. It was the Armour Raid that brought them in. The capture of the uh, members of the Republican Army. They brought them in. And we c could not find places big enough to hold the recruits. You had students and you had uh, workers and they all joined together. Some of them were studying law, doctors, veterinarians, you, know, you name it, they, they were in the IRA, they all joined the IRA at that stage. So when Charlie Murphy then decided that uh, I had to get sorted out, so I was uh, told to go to a house in Ballyferm on London Road and get sworn in there. And we myself and Tomas McGillan arrived and uh, we went in and when we, the door was opened, um, they had a candle on the end of the stairway. And I took it that it was uh, an underground movement and, this bit of show was a great idea, you know. Went up the top landing and there was another candle light, you see, no lights on. And then we went into the front room where the deed was done and 
Tomas will give him himself for new members at the IRA. It was only years after, because Tom McGill, Tomas McGill was uh, an employee of the ESB. He was a clerk in the ESB. And I was at a funeral, I think it was Cattle Goulding. And uh, I said, Do you remember Tom, the time we joined in, in that house in Paddy Fairman? The cans and all that. I said, do you, do you remember? I remarked the fact that you know it's real. This is a real uh, sort of thing you see on the films. The cans lighting up the stairs and all that. Well, he says, Liam, you better forget about. It. He says, uh, they never pay that electric bill. <laughs> so I thought that was great. Yeah. <laughs> so the light had been cut off. We were, and the only way to get sworn in was with candles. <laughs> so your involvement in the in Operation Harvest, could you well, let us know Operation Harvest, what part you played in that? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, they looked for volunteers. Uh, they were looking for a volunteer, first of all, around December of 54. And they said it would take three months, you have to get... Uh, pack in the job and go away, tell nobody where you're going, and which I thought was a bit ridiculous now at that stage because you'd have to let somebody know where you were going or to be reporting to the police that you were, <laughs> you were missing. You know? So, anyway, December came and went, and then I was approached in January of uh, 55. And uh, I was brought before the chief of staff and the editor general of the IRA. And they said, uh, This operation is on. Are you still in? I said, Yeah, okay. And uh, they told me what it was, right? But I knew what it was because they told me it was a three months duration, which hit me immediately as that's basic training. In any army, you know what I mean, in three months. Today. So I, I said, well, I, I thought it was uh, army or something, like that, you know, the three months. You know. So he said, oh, well, you're right, yeah. We want you to go and join the Royal Irish Fusiliers, Goth Barracks Army. Now, they had a man in there during the raid in, in 54, was uh, John, Sean Garen. So my job then was to go in and see uh, what arrangements that they made against the second raid. You know. So uh, I remained there for, I went, I went, uh, went up and I arrived in, in uh, I think it was Portadown and then I tried to get to Armagh but I must, I asked a, a person to, well they direct me to Gaff Barracks and they directed me, but they gave me the wrong directions. So he must have been a nationalist, you know. Because I ended up, I didn't get to the barracks till half four that evening, soaked in rain and snow and everything else. And I was shaking with the cold. And I knocked on the door of the, of the, the gates and a British soldier opened it. And I told him I was interested in joining. So he brought me in anyway, and he, he says to me, I think you're fucking mad. And uh, I said, well, there's no work down south, you know, so. Brought me in, a recruiting officer then came along, and he was a Dublin man. And uh, he sought me out then from there, uh, a few days later, I, from there I was sent to uh, Belfast where I was interviewed by uh, the RUC Special Branch. And when they seen my name, of course, there wasn't, you know, a, a, a really uh, English name. Well, and then my mother's maiden name was Trimble, and my name was Sutcliffe, so the cop just looked at me and went out and told the sergeant that there's no point in interviewing him, sure he's, you know. I had the right names. So 
they were sent back and I was sworn in to serve the Queen for the next three years. But the funny thing about it is they told me that I was going to be put into a squad called the Lady Smith Squad. And the peculiar thing about this, I had an uncle killed in relief of Lady Smith in the Boer War. He had died in, in, in relief of Lady Smith. So I, I was uh, delighted with this because it, my grandmother told me her brother was killed in the, in the Boer War at the relief of Lady Smith. So that was great. So what they were doing then at that stage was uh, they were waiting for uh, recruits. At that time it was uh, so it was national service. So about a week or so later two lorries arrived in Gough Barracks full of civilians from all parts of England, mostly London with all Irish names, Kellys and Murphys and all that like, you know. And some of these fellas were unbelievable because they were dressed in teddy bike gear, you know. Thick soles, rubber soles and the skinny trousers and the velvet collars and the hair down the back and all that, you know. And when they all jumped out of the back of the lorry, they were all dressed in different colours greys and blues and so everybody there was laughter all over the the square you know when they seen what was coming into into the British army so the next thing was I was in the Nafi at the time with a soldier who had come back from Korea and he was suffering a uh, battle uh, distress because he had lost it in the war and the Korean War and uh, he was being discharged and uh, he was asking me what, what, what was on and I said ah the chaps from uh, England had just arrived you know they're all dressed very funny which they were now like you know but the officer everybody was laughing but then the next day uh, there was a great laugh altogether because the barber got to go on the heads Right, so he had this big razor thing. Ran, he ran over all the heads, and all of a sudden now, uh, we all uh, we all had the same head, and uh, we were given uniforms, and that's how we started to train. So I had a, a camera, which was given to me a Minix camera, and I had uh, go. I was going around taking photographs of all the different changes that took place since the raid in June. You know. So I remained there for four months. The man in charge there, the OC, I think he was, or the CO, the OC of Gough Barracks was a man called McNeil. And his son became a great actor, Sam Neil. And that was his son. And I remember the British, the, uh, the British Army gave him a deal, you know, the deal was resign because he was in Dublin when the raid took place. So they gave him a deal, you know, take this job in New Zealand or leave the army, you know, I'd say that was it. So he decided to go to New Zealand and that's how Sam Neill, who was a, a young kid at the time, and I loaded all their gear onto a lorry for to go to New Zealand. And uh, it was later on I found out uh, who Sam Neill was. He was actually the son of the old city. Who referred to the IRA at one of the lectures I had uh, in, in, uh, in Gough Barracks. That the raid on Gough Barracks was carried out by sewer rats from the slums of Dublin. Uh, of course, I, I uh, told all this to the, uh, to the army when I came out, you know. So, what do you think? Um, 
Were you involved with the Joe Crystal group during the border uh, campaign? Uh, the border ca campaign started, no, it, uh, I did, uh, Crystal, Crystal wanted to go ahead. Crystal wanted power, you see, and he couldn't get the power. Because in order to get the power, you have to be in any democratic uh, organisation. You have to be uh, voted in, and that's the way it worked in the Iranian. And there was no way they, they were going to give him control of the uh, he, he He had an idea in his mind that he wanted to be, that he thought he should be chief of staff. And I'd say this, uh, this came in, uh, he was studying law in university. College Dublin, and uh, on the raid in Armagh, he was actually doing an article on the Constitution, and joined, and joined the army later. And he came to Armagh. How he got there, I don't know, but he got there anyway, and he took part in the Gough Barracks raids. You know, he was also involved in the Alma, so he thought he was going to be chief of staff. But I spoke to. Him. The Adjutant General later on, and he said there was no way he was going to be chief of staff. Never in a month of Sundays. And I believe that that was the case. Uh, I didn't know at that stage, but uh, Operation Harvest, I went for Crystal because I thought he was going to do more, but I was wrong, and I made a big mistake by doing that. And that's why I, I would. Uh, the greatest thing that ever happened was the splits, and we had taken part in the split, which I thought was very, very wrong. And um, could you tell us something about uh, Nelson Pillar and um, about that operation? Well, the operation of Nelson's Pillar is, is uh, it's well known now, isn't it? Really, I, I. Uh, I had a meeting with, uh, I, we had a, a drink actually in the pub and we were discussing the, the uh, harvest, uh, Operation Harvest and then we were discussing other things and this girl, she said to me, uh, uh, here we are discussing uh, the Brits and all this sort of business and yet we have a British admiral in the middle of O'Connor, Connor Street. So I said, well, he won't be always there, like, you know, because uh, I, I, had, uh, I had looked at it before and Crystal, in fact, tried it in, uh, I think it was, what, 54 or 55, I think it was 55, they tried to burn it down. But uh, uh, at that stage, with Seamus Salahan and students and that, you know, the thing didn't work and it, it, no, it was never born, so he was still standing there in 66. So I decided to go and see Joe. And uh, I hadn't seen him for a while and I said about the pillar and he said it can't be done. I thought it could be done. And he said about the people living around, I said no. We take take the top off and then they went they they uh, they, they pull it down. I thought it was going to be that's the way I thought. Not the top off it and then they just break down the rest of it. So Chris has said now say ah okay. So I left anyway, believing it had to go elsewhere to get the stuff to carry out the job. When The Sunday night, his brother arrived and, and uh, said to me that he wanted to see me back in the house in Frankfurt Avenue. So I went back over and he said that the pillow was going to be blown the next day. And would I take part in the, in the, in the blowing of the pillow? So I said, yeah, I was the of course. <clears throat> so. What happened then was that uh, I took the, I, <coughs> on the Monday afternoon, I headed for the pillar. And I headed there with a, a son of mine. He was uh, three and a half at the time. 
and we headed down on the 123 bus to uh, Kings Bridge as was known then, but Houston Bridge you now, and uh, we were picked up there by a man in the car and we drove down to O'Connor Street and I brought the, the mix, as I call it, was the bomb itself, the electrics, another guy, I brought them in and I brought the, the, uh, the jelly and the aminol in and uh, went up the stairs with the young flu. And it was then that preparations were made to blow it. So what happened then is that the chap was, that was blown had uh, fixed everything up and I thought he looked a bit nervous and I, I was afraid for the young lad because he was only three and a half. Now the, at that stage there was only three of us on the pillar. The man that was setting the mine, himself and the son, so I wanted the son after. But he didn't want me to go. He wanted me to stay with him until he had everything complete. So I said, well, I'm afraid for the kid. You know? So he says, all right, it's finished. We'll go. So we went anyway. And your man locked up the pillar. Yeah. My, I had a brother in law who was a former partner in the Board of Works, and he is on the GPO. And he actually seen the young fellow running around, you know, the three and a half year old, three and a half year old, running around the top of the pillar. And he knew him immediately. And, when I looked across, I knew who was on the GPO. So, that evening then, the wife got her word that we were on the pillar. But when she asked me, I said, no, we passed by the pillar, aren't we? Ah, she said, must be a mix-up, you know. But uh, the girls started to question the young lad, you see. Uh, were you? On steps, and I did no, no, no. I was, I was in the, in the pictures, because I had brought them to Grafton Street, where it was a, a, a cinema, who used to show the funnies, you know, and uh, he'd forgotten all about the time he was up on the pillar. You know. He doesn't remember, never remembered, and uh, the guy had a question, but he didn't, he didn't. Uh, he didn't involve himself. <laughs> and the next thing was, that was it. As far as I was concerned, the pillar would now be gone. On uh, Tuesday, the 1st. So, when Tom went to bed, missed the news the next morning, got up. Got on the bus and I worked in a shop in Reynolds and uh, no Simon. There was no pillar. The pillar was still there. So what I done then was uh, oh no, I was I was in the shop and the next thing Crystal arrived, Joe oh, Crystal arrived. And he was in an awful mess earlier. He said uh, it didn't go. I said, no, I didn't. So he said, it has to come back down. I said, okay, we take it down. But I said, we need two people to take it down. That's okay, he says. I'll get Mick and he'll, take, he, he'll give you a hand to get it down. So I said, okay. So then the next thing, Joe went back to lectures in Rat Mines in the college, and uh, myself and Mick went to the pillar. Now when we got into O'Connor Street, I'd say it was about a uh, quarter to ten maybe. It's nearly ten, I mean, it's in that time. And the amazing thing about it is, uh, I was, what, there was something, something on my mind that how are we going to take it off? 
because it was all wired, you know. I hadn't a clue, I hadn't nothing. In so I went into Cleary's and I purchased uh, a nail clippers. You know, you can sneak the old words, it'll do something for you, like, you know. So then we had coffee in a cafe face in the corner, and I explained it. And then he told me, then he told me what happened on the Monday. That when we left the, the mine on the pillar, they met Joe. At that time, at Houston, there was a big uh, gents' toilet, you know, in the middle of the road. It's completely different now. There's two bridges there now, isn't there? I think. But the original uh, Houston Bridge, or which is King's Bridge, was there, and there was a toilet in the middle of Park A Street, you know, gents' toilet, and it had barrels because they were in the process of uh, removing the toilet to make way for the traffic, you know. But anyway, that's what happened. We were there, and anyway. I went, after the pillar I went, I went to the pictures with the young lad. And then it was the next morning that Mick explained to me what happened. They went back and they met there in that toilet, in, in them toilets there. And uh, Joe said to, to Pat, uh, well, is it fixed? Oh, yeah, he says, yeah. And what time is it going off at? I said, it won't go off at four in the morning. So Chris said to him, it's going off at four in the morning. He said, yeah, four in the morning when they go off. He said, it's not going off at four in the morning, Patty. He says, it's going off at four today. Because the clock had only 12 hours in it. That meant the clock <laughs> was going to go off at uh, four o'clock an hour, an hour later. Or an hour... Yeah, down later, a little older now, later. So Morphy lasted down. Pat lasted and said, uh, Jesus, we better ring the special branch and tell them there's a bomb up there, let them take it on. Or get the yarn. And Chris said, No, fuck it. Let it go. Now, there would have been devastation in, in, in Dublin. You know? I didn't know about this. I was in the pictures in I was in Grafton Street. You know. Three of them were down and the Jacks discussed the band and the bomb was to go out for. But the bomb didn't go off. Thank be God it didn't go off anyway. And uh, I am now the next morning standing at the bus stop looking over and the little man I forget his name. Uh, he uh, he opened up. It's a bit hazy rain at the time, and uh, he opened up. And Mick ran up up the stairs, and when I got up, he was looking down on the mine. From the, there was a parapet there. You went. Were you ever up on the pillar? No. You went. You went out on the platform, and he was at the the aperture there where you, and he was looking down at it and uh, I looked at it and I said the, the bomb is alive which it was alive and uh, because the the the, uh, the clock had gone like you know the time had gone off and uh, I said it's it's now alive you know but we didn't if you start pulling wires we didn't know what was going to happen uh, so I said, no, we don't have to pull any wires. What I've done is I took out the nail clippers and I got him to get this bag, a whole doll, which we had purchased in Liffey Street about an hour previously. And I got him to put the mine into the whole doll. I clipped all the wires, separated it from the battery and I put, he took that and I took the rest and we left the pillar. On uh, Tuesday, that was the 
forced of uh, forced of marriage. So then, when I examined all the whole, all the stuff, I found that it was completely and utterly a load of crap because it was it was wrongly word number one, and then it was wrongly word plus they used the battery they used was a bicycle battery. What they used to put in a a bicycle lamp. And I couldn't believe this. So I redesigned it anyway. And I used a nylon bolt with the screw tabs and uh, I designed it over the following week. Left it on the Monday, the seventh, and it went off on the eighth. Uh, Liam, can you tell us, did you know um, Seamus Costello? I did indeed, I knew him very well because uh, he came from a farming background really and uh, I always found as a, as a young lad around 16 or 17 I think he was when he came into the army and uh, he had a great pair of arms on him he, he laser uh, ended up a uh, salesman in uh, Ford Motor Company on Parnell Street there. I think it was Archers or something like that. And, uh, but in this particular case, we were all up the mountains on a weekend. Eamon, Eamon Macamas, Eamon Thomas is we, his best known then as, and uh, myself and uh, I had to do a Ford car and uh, it was 12 at night and Seamus fell over a barbed wire and uh, had ripped the, the arm, it was the left arm and uh, he was in a bad way but I bandaged it up and Eamon Thomas instructed me to take him to hospital because it was really, it looked very bad now he had a four inch four or five inches of a gap on the, on the arm and uh, I said okay bundled him into the car and we headed for uh, is it step aside I think it was we come down that way and there's a big piece uh, there's a big uh, cordon of police around the place and I didn't know what was going on and I remember the sergeant stopped in the car and said to me uh, where have you come from where are you going I said we're, we're a, a troop of boy scouts and I said uh, this this scout here fell over bound wire and I'm rushing him to hospital I see his arm and he looked at so he cleared everywhere and, and lashed us through and uh, I got him into the Mead Hospital where he was, uh, he was the bravest young fellow ever. He had the arm out and your man who was, uh, he was a Chinese doctor, performed the stitching and uh, he never moved his arm. And he, he, uh, he uh, had, a, had a bad arm that night anyway. It was about five inches long. Stitch, your man stitched it up, but there wasn't a move out. I was a very brave man, I, I found. You know. mm. uh, like we may have had disagreements, but I, I thought Seamus uh, Costa was a very brave, brave man. Mm. And I, I think it was Connolly's, uh, James Connolly's uh, daughter, Nora, that passed her mark that he was, she, he was the nearest thing to her father than anyone else she had met previously. You know. How did how did you feel, Liam, about the split with the officials and the provisionals? I, I thought the whole thing was wrong. You know, I, I never, I never ever take part in any split again in my life. Now, not that I get a chance, but uh, the thing about it is, there's great men on both sides. But one was a like the probably were revolutionary, and you wouldn't they? They in the long run, 
we never got an extra blade of grass, you know. And all the deaths, all the hunger strikers, we never got one blade of grass extra, you know. We're still 26 and 6, you know what I mean? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, Liam, um, could you tell us how you became involved in uh, Serera? I do, I do, I'll tell you how I became involved in Serera. I had now uh, sort of had withdrawn. I was with Crystal doing uh, small jobs and that, but I withdrew from there and I was getting on uh, with a family. And the next thing was Liam Walsh arrived at the house. And oh, it it was after the pillar, I think. Yeah, it was after. Of course, it was after the pillar. Uh, it was in the seventy one, was it? He was blown up. Well, I'm not sure. The, was it seventy one? I think seventy. Seventy. Yeah. Oh, there's seventy or seventy one. Yeah. But he came to me anyway. What? Seventy one. Seventy one was it? Yeah. And uh, he came to me one night and uh, he said that he was going to do a job and could I explain this to him and that to him. Well, that's it. Uh, I never give people advice on this stuff unless, you know, you've been, uh, you've been trained at this sort of business. And I said, I would, because I'd be afraid another fellow would be blown up. And... Uh, he, we, we parted friends anyway and the next thing was I got a phone call that he had blown himself up. Uh, another man had given him a mine and show up, said it was done this way and that way and the next thing was he was blown up. I went down to see him in the marjory I was asked by members of Sarah if I would take charge of the funeral, and I said I would, yeah. Because Liam and I had, uh, Liam had come in the R, into the IRA uh, not long after myself, and I had recruited him, you know. So I said I would, and I took charge of the funeral then, from then. And then I got involved in Sarah. How did um, Sarah Era see the struggle for freedom developing and its own role within that? Well, I tell you one thing, uh, Sarah Era were a very loosely organised because uh, you didn't know who, who was who. And, uh, there was no army council, there was no chief of staff. Fellow to making themselves this, that, and the other. So I just swung along with it and hoped for the best, you know. Um, could you tell us about uh, Peter Graham and Maureen Keegan? And did they take part in the armed actions? Well, Maureen Keegan did, yes. Uh, Maureen Keegan took part in uh, an action with myself. You know. I'm not going to tell you where, but it, it was in, in Dublin County, anyway. And uh, yeah, she was she she was a uh, she was in uh, favour of our armed re revolution. Uh, Peter Graham, I didn't know too well, but to this day, uh, I, I was very disturbed at the way he was shot. I don't I think that was uh, uncalled for. I don't think. Peter Graham should have been. It shouldn't have happened to him. And um, were Sarah involved in the North in the 1969? Well, they were indeed, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we, we carried out a fair, a fair number of, uh, of uh, explosions up there. Uh, but, uh, then I was also running for with the provost as well because I was uh, being given stuff down south and carried up uh, and explained to guys in uh, 
on the border of what way they worked and on this. Most, sometimes they come down to, I think it's Colin there, you know, just out beyond the swords. You know? And uh, I would show them there in different places where, where how, the, how the, the, the bomb worked and what bombs they could use here and there. And uh, they, uh, that was going on for a good while too, where I was with there anyway. And uh, then we we done jobs across the world as well. Could you tell us about Liam Dalton, who died in England? Well, I knew Liam Dalton also, who came in with uh, with Liam Walsh. He came in that time in the fifties. Uh, then there was. A bit of turmoil be between different groups, and which I never agreed with. It. And, uh, I, a lot of them went to England to work. Liam Dalton, uh, Gerrisy, Sean Gerrisy, and lots of other people went to England to work then, you know. And uh, Liam came over the last time you see. Liam Dalton was on uh, the keys there. He was in an Easter commemoration. Then he went back to England, and the next thing I heard was that uh, he had fallen from a bridge and was killed. And uh, but at this time, to my mind anyway, I don't think he was. Uh, I think he was ill at the time. You know? Um, would you better tell us something about the leadership of Serrera? Or was there no real leadership? Was there no main I leader? couldn't see it. You had, you had the likes of the, the brothers, uh, Paddy and Joe. What was their name? Dylan. Dylan's. Mm -hmm. You had the Dylan's and you had a few more fellas. Uh, Liam Byron and Eamon Deegan. You had a few more fellas there. But as leaders, you, 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 uh, there, there were f split factions within that group as well in in in, in Saudi Arabia. You know, the, some fellas didn't make this fellow and that fellow, and they were shooting one another and everything. You know, so. so, so what happened yeah. to Saudi Arabia? Why did it fail? I think myself, it's it failed. You know, there, there was no support for none whatsoever, but. I mean that uh, you wouldn't get that idea from the funerals of uh, Lee Munch. I mean, which was a huge, huge funeral in Dublin. You know, well, that's what happened. Splits. And um, what did you do after Sarah ended? Sarah ended. I well, still uh, operated. Uh, I still operated with the Crystal Group. Uh, I was carrying out jobs and if they pulled a stroke, if the Brits pulled a stroke in Ireland, I pulled a stroke in, in Britain. So how do you see the struggle around the national and class question being advanced in the 21st century? And do you feel pleased that there are so many young Republicans in Ireland today? Well, it's great to see young Republicans. I mean, our nation should be free, you know. The thing about it is, like, I don't think we're going to have a united Ireland unless, we, we, let's face it, the Protestants that are there, they're, 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 uh, unless we have them along with us. And the people realised that it was they who led it in 1798, like, you know. They, they led it, the nation in 1798, nearly, nearly uh, united the country. But uh, in order for the the Brits to get over that, what they done was they separated Catholic and Protestant, and gave a, a little more, what would you say, beverage to the Protestant people than they did to the Catholic people. But then they done a deal with Rome, and of course that was it. Then you know, I mean, look how how the the, the Catholic religion suffered and the people suffered because they were in that religion. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
That's lovely. Thank you very much, mm. Liam Sutcliffe. Mm. You see, it happened, uh, an action took place now. And uh, and members of the provisional organisation were killed. And we took it upon ourselves then that we would retaliate. Now, a funny thing happened then because Crystal asked me to carry it out. But when I, when I got there, when I arrived there, I found that uh, someone had entered Crystal's house and he was of the opinion it was members of Sarah Air, which was ridiculous. Because when I asked the housekeeper later on how they dressed, and she said, oh, they were very well dressed. Well, everybody knows Sarah Air wasn't very well dressed. You know what I mean? You know, they weren't going around with, with ties and shorts and collars and all that sort of thing. And I knew then there was something wrong. Well, his house had been broken into. But the minute she told me the way they were dressed, I knew immediately I was surprised that Crystal would blame Sarah Aaron. Or saying like they had inf inside information, which meant that I had uh, done something wrong or something like that, which was cool which was completely uh, ridiculous for a barrister to turn around and, and uh, accuse someone of that. Because I knew Sarah Aaron. Uh, they never had a pair of pants on, no matter when you seen them, you know what I mean? They barely had a, mm -hmm. enough clothes. Mm -hmm. But when I asked the housekeeper, she said that uh, they, they, they were very well dressed and suits on them and all that, so I knew who it was, and it certainly wasn't Sarah Aaron. It was, uh, I'd say, the special detective, you know, Dublin Hassett, you know. So, I still went ahead, which I thought, when I thought about it later, I was stupid to do what I did. And I went and I carried out the operation. But, when I, when I, when I done this, I was told then I had flown over and then uh, I was told to uh, give the ticket over to another fellow who had driven over, who had driven the, 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 the uh, stuff over to me in, in, in uh, Britain and uh, I was to drive back and he was to fly home. So I said okay. Uh, he said, you're booked in at Liverpool and you go to Liverpool and uh, you can board the ship there with the, with the car, you know. But halfway down the M50, I won't tell you where it is because uh, I was on the M50 anyway, or the M1, sorry, not the M50, the M1. And uh, halfway down I got this feeling that there was something going on now and there was something wrong. Do you know how you get a feeling like that? And instead of uh, taking the turn for Liverpool, I drove to Birmingham, where a cousin of mine lived. Uh, she's since moved to Australia, but uh, I drove the car in, knocked on the door, and she nearly had a uh, kittens because when she seen me, she said, what are you doing over here? Because she knew I was a, a member of the Republican movement, you see. So she said to me, what's wrong? I said, I had to get out of England in a hurry. Would you ring her lingus and see how to get a, a, a flight on, or a, a seat on, on the seven o'clock flight? And uh, we got, eventually, to cut a long story short, I got on the flight. And uh, at first they said they'd not know no, no, it, but then they told me to come and stand by. And I drove, uh, I, I drove out of the airport and 
I got on the flight and flew to Dublin. But the, the amazing thing happened to me uh, again. I was sitting on the plane beside this fella, you know. And uh, he says to me, do you like flying? I said, uh, well, I don't mind. I said, uh, right, so I'll tell you a story. He says, I was on a flight going across the desert. And he said, the storm came up, the sand thing. And they, were, they didn't uh, get information on it. And the plane, he said, uh, took in the sand. And your man had to dive from 36,000 down to 2,000 to clear the engines. And I said, Christ, that was frightening. Well, he says it, it was frightening, but that's not what frightens me. What frightens me is that you know these bombers that get on planes. So I, I, I was dumbfounded. <laughs> yeah, sure. You're sitting beside one now. So uh, the next thing was we arrived at Dublin Airport. <laughs> and he said to me, I'll bring you home or I'll bring you here. And I said, it's okay, I'm home. A system I And I'll never forget that. <laughs> Three days after, walking down Garner Street, where I had a part time job as a bartender. And a branch car came by me, slowed up. And the fellow shouts out the window, Do you not like boats, Liam? I said, No. <laughs> Everybody was expecting to go by boat. I didn't go. <coughs>